Hi, John. Good day, everyone. Good evening. Good night for those of you on the other side of the globe from where, where I am um, and some of us are. So nice to see you all. Welcome to today's Necessary Conversation with Dr. John Ehrenfeld. Um, we'll be discussing insights from John's book, most recent book, The Right Way to Flourish, Reconnecting to the Real World. Um, I'm Erica Steckler from the University of Massachusetts Lowell, um, also uh, the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility is a sponsor of this event. This is also, um, uh, uh, this forum, this research forum is a, an initiative of the UN Prime Working Group on Humanistic Management. Um, for those of you familiar with humanistic management, uh, you've heard the terms protecting dignity and promoting well-being, um, and hopefully we're all taking that to heart um, and also into our research and teaching. Um, with that, I'm, I'm not sure if Michael is here. Michael Pearson, are you on with us right now? He may not be. No, so he usually likes to say a quick hello. So on behalf of Michael and all of us in the International Humanistic Management Association, welcome. Um, John, I would love to introduce you just briefly, if that's all right. And just so everyone knows, I will be putting um, some information in the chat. We, before I introduce John, we are recording the session, so this will be available to all of you, as will the chat. So please do um, input any questions along our conversation, uh, comments, resources into the chat that serves as a resource for all. Um, and we will also moderate the Q&A with John from the chat. Um, and I will be piecing a chat message together. You'll see it a few times because folks who join a little later after I post won't see it if I don't post a few times. Um, all right, so on to John. John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will say I was delighted to meet up with John recently at an event here in Boston um, and we got to chat a little bit and I thought this is absolutely perfect and John graciously agreed. Um, so John returned to MIT um, which is his alma mater back in 1985 after a very long career in, in environmental um, in the environmental field. He then retired in 2000 as director of the MIT program on technology, business, and environment. He then served until 2009 as exec executive director of the International Society for Industrial Ecology and guided its development from its founding in 2000. He is the author of this most recent book that we'll be discussing today, The Right Way to Flourish, as well as others, including Sustainability by Design and Flourish, a frank conversation about sustainability. I'll put some of these links in the chat. Um, in October of 1999, the World Resources Institute honored him with their first Lifetime Achievement Award for his academic accomplishments in the field. He received the Founders Award for Distinguished Service from the Academy of Management's Organization and Natural, and Natural Environment Division. That was in August 2000. He's an editor of the Journal of Industrial Ecology, and he holds a BS and um, Doctor of Science in Chemical Engineering from MIT. He is co-author or author of over 200 papers, books, reports, and other publications. And more recently, he's added poetry to his writing. Um, routines. So John, um, really welcome. So thrilled to have you here. Uh, this is a conversation. So I love you to kick us off with um, where you've been and bring us to now and then we'll keep chatting about flourishing in your book. Thank you, Erica. It's a really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I see, uh, I see some very old friends here. And I, I'll stress the word old. <laughs> But it's delightful to see uh, uh, some some of you I haven't seen in a very long time. So, um, well, this uh, this this uh, event came kind of serendipitously by out of a conversation, as Erica said. We met at a recent event, um, and um, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I I I, I hope I will leave you with some some. Uh, uh, trenchant thoughts and uh, uh, and some provocative uh, questions you can uh, ask your, yourself from time to time. Um, 
start, start, uh, Erica gave you a pretty good picture of, 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 of the, the kind of professional uh, side of who I am. Uh, but today's talk really began mostly after I retired. Um, toward the end of my career at MIT, this is in the this is in the late eighties, nineties. Sustainability became a, a the issue, the main environmental issue. It, it it collapsed air, water, climate change, all kind of things into a single rubric: uh, sustainability. And we at MIT got very much involved in that, and I got very much involved in our programs. Um, as I retired, I thought, well, I'll continue to do this. I, I, as Erica said, I got involved in this little subdiscipline, industrial ecology, but it had a lot of bearing on on the kind of systemic way that uh, certainly I and a lot of others were looking at sustainability. But as I started writing and I began writing soon after I actually brought a draft of a, of a book with me. I'd started MIT, got very concerned about the idea of sustainability and became quite critical. And so the three books that uh, Erica mentioned are really quite critical of how we were looking at sustainability and critical of all the, the efforts that went we're going toward it. Mainly the, the, the thing that got me sort of working on this was the, 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 the word itself. You know, sustainability doesn't mean anything unless you have something to sustain. It began with a definition by the UN's uh, World Commission on, on uh, uh, whatever development and environment as sustainable development, development. Keep going, keep developing, keep growing, but in a way that leaves the environment in good shape. Um, but it didn't really have much to do with the, the nature of the system. It's pretty clear that, that growth is not something that can be maintained. So, I, and and when, when I started, especially at MIT, I was looking at largely the way businesses were responding to environmental issues. It was pretty clear, even though they talked about being sustainable, sustainable business as a adjective, sustainable strategy, sustainable products, sustainable this, sustainable that, sustainable luxury, sustainable brands, all lurking behind every one of those definitions was simply a desire to grow. And that the efforts that were being made were largely eco-efficient form, some form of eco-efficiency. And eco-efficiency is just a means to grow, use the benefits of the efficient uh, resources then to put into growth. And so it's a self-defeating uh, notion. Uh, sustainable ability by, by design was the, the output of that critique, largely looking at the trying to try to identify what was causing this uh, uh, assembly of, 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 of bads. Uh, basically the the my conclusion and that's one that's really relevant today and, and 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 I'll come back to it probably several times is that what we called unsustainability what what was being looked at as the problems both natural and social issues that like inequality included but climate change was certainly coming into its own in those days that these bads were unintended consequences of normal behavior. Now that's a very important point to make. We were doing what our paradigm, what our culture, what our system of beliefs and rules, what our norms were telling us to do 
and this stuff was happening. Now, the strategy that was being taken then was to try to fix things around the edges. Again, more kinds of eco-efficiency, uh, carbon trading, carbon pricing, trying, trying to deal with this thing through some kind of technocratic or technological means. Uh, even today, one of the major uh, strategies for dealing with global warming is, is geoengineering. Sort of, okay, we'll fix the system itself throw stuff up in the atmosphere, put iron in the oceans, do things so that we uh, reduce the uh, greenhouse effect, but no attention to what the root causes were. So in sustainability by design, I, I started out on a, a inquiry to, you know, why, what was going on? And then at that point, uh, I argued that the, the root causes, or the, at least what I thought were the root causes, were a couple of the beliefs on which our modern cultures are based. They go back to the Enlightenment, maybe even a little earlier, but they were the idea that uh, the world's a machine. You get to know how the parts work, you can begin to understand the whole. And humans were also mechanical. We were really machines, hungry machines, insatiably always trying to satisfy our need. That, that's the essence of Smith, Smith's arguments in, in, in his, and in the idea of the invisible hand, which has really driven economic policy and political economies in the modern world today. So the sustainability by design really focused on that critique and used that critique to try to argue for ways out of it. At the same time, uh, really rather serendipitously, I, I have to say without any kind of deep, deep analysis, um, I came upon the idea of flourishing as the, the, the best indicator of what is sustainable, flourishing. Um, and I defined sustainability in the first book and have ever since as sustainability as flourishing. I was at a, 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 some personal training in the, the late 90s at which we were each of the 200 or so participants was got up and uttered sort of who I am. Well, everybody got up and you're supposed to say something like, I'm a possibility that, oh, my family will be happy forever. I'm a possibility that I'll lose some weight. And blah, blah, blah. I got up and I said, I am the possibility that life on this planet will flourish forever. Now, those words came from nowhere. And uh, at the time, I thought nowhere, but I know now where they came from. And I'll let you in on that in just a little bit. Right. But Thank following you. that, I have been defining sustainability as the emergence of flourishing, flourishing as the achievement of the, of the potential of life. Life has a teleology, life is there to reproduce itself, life is going in a direction and flourishing is an indicator that we are operating at our potential. Uh, Erica and I have been talking a little bit, I'm trying to learn a little more about the, the whole area of humanistic management. And it's, it's pretty clear to me, and I hope it will be clear to you as we, we get to, to look a little closer at flourishing, that the idea of dignity and well-being are, are, are completely commensurate, congruent synonymous, whatever you want to talk with the idea of flourishing. It's, it's a semantic difference, but not any kind of substantive difference. So John, yeah. um, before we get too far into flourishing, I just wanted to ask a few more questions. Um, in part, I'm, you know, I love that your book and its introduction and your introduction of it, um, you talk about uh, flourishing as a radical way to proceed into the future. 
Um, and I do want to hear more about flourishing, but I also want to hear about in parallel, how do we get there? And I think systems change has been an important uh, concept that, um, you know, that you've highlighted in the book. And I'd love to hear just a bit of your insight on it. I know there are several scholars here who focus on transformation. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for uh, straightening me out. I was about to get there, but I need that little help. Um, well, for, I'll just say flourishing is, is, a, is a system, is an emergent property. It, 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 it appears when the system is operating right. Unsustainability or, or the collapse, these are systemic issues. And one of the big failures uh, that I, I, I see, I still see, is that it's never been, that, that the, the concerns we have have never been fully recognized as, as, as systemic in nature. We still see climate change as a relatively complicated but isolated phenomena. And it's yet to be traced back, as I will argue, to the fundamental root causes of it. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think these, these big issues are unintended consequences of these normal behaviors. Well, you, if you're going to try to undo these and, and change things, you, you have to change them at the roots. You can't just fix things. You know, normality is, is, is an, uh, it's sort of also an emergent from all the roots, the behaviors, the beliefs, and basically from the paradigm that is driving a culture, an institution uh, at any level. Our, 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 our way of operating in the modern world is largely to listen to the story we tell about it. That story is largely the story that science tells us about and create our institutions, including the norms, the rules, out of that story. Well, if you want to change normality, you got to change the story. I mean, that, that, that's pretty straightforward. We can go back to Thomas Kuhn and his idea of the structure of scientific revolutions and pull that one out of the way that Kuhn talks about it. So that, Erica, is really the, the, the sort of bottom line of the importance of looking at this systemically and really looking at it in terms of, 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 of a transformation, of a paradigm shift, of, of words, other words you can use, but words that say we can't just simply fix this system. We have to change this system. So how do makes, we... Yeah, but one thing, but then that begs the question of, okay, what do we have to change? Yeah. So... Yep, that was my next question. So. So how, if we're living this and this is our normal, you know, how do we pick our heads up, um, you know, and, and, and figure out what do we need to change? Well, I said, I, I mentioned it, the, the, I, I, thought, I thought that the uh, culprits were these two beliefs. This is this part of our cosmology, our worldview, our paradigm that, that the, the world's a machine. So we can treat it that way, we can understand it, we can take it apart piece by piece by piece, and then we can put it together by putting those pieces back together. And that human beings can be understood again by science. Uh, uh, some natural science, but a lot of what we think about is to understand human beings is how do they work together so we add the social sciences, but all of them have this basic underlying story that we, we can find the truths about how they work through scientific methods. So I, I have, um, uh, let me just think how to, um, so the question is, how do we, those 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 don't explain things? You know, we we know, and I'll talk a little bit more about. We we know that this idea of the the world and humans as complicated machines isn't enough. We are complex, which is a a, a word that tells, says 
uh, we can't really understand everything by science. There are just nonlinearities. There are, are, are things that science has real trouble revealing and that we need other uh, ways. So early on in, in the, again, I'm using my books kind of help me organize my thoughts here. Uh, argue that you, you have to stop relying on reduction of science and begin to be more pragmatic, which is a, a better way of, of teasing out the, the root causes in uh, complex systems. For, for you here, I know there are a lot of you good operations people. You're familiar maybe with the Toyota production system, uh, a fundamentally pragmatic system, the most emulated sort of way inquiry of, of problem solving worldwide, basically uses pragmatism rather than positivism to, to bring out the root causes and deal with them. So one of the, the solutions was be more pragmatic. And the second one was sort of, is there an alternative to this, this Smithian notion of the hungry, never satisfied individual, self interested individual. And I think there, there, there is. And that is the sort of existential human being that's available to us in the work of Martin Heidegger and Sartre and the existentialists that, that say, look, you're, 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 you're not. That's not what it, humans are really. That the thing that makes us different from all other living species is that we are in the world. We exist by understanding the world. We care for the world. The fundamental characteristic of human is, in Heidegger's work, sorga, which is translated to care. Now, we know we do that because we have instances where we, it's clear that our behavior is more caring than instrumental. Altruism, for example. Altruism is, is sort of saying, hey, I'll take more care of you even at my own possibly peril. Well, economists just say, oh, it's just the same old behavior. It's just that you have a real high value for whatever you're doing. So your utility calculus says be altruistic. Well, that was the sort of end of, of a long notion. And uh, I, I worked with that for, for a number of years. In the following the, the first book, and Andy Hoffman and I wrote this other book called Flourishing, which was really more an examination of, of, of the importance of flourishing without, without digging much deeper into what it really was. It simply took some of the ideas out of the first book, I think sharpened the critique, uh, and what brought, made more clear what we were talking about with flourishing. Well, that was, that sort of, that was, that was it. I was by then uh, at a point where it was, you know, wonder what the hell am I doing anymore? I did a little teaching at the time. Uh, when I was at MIT, I, I used to kid my students. I said, well, I, I started teaching before you were born. But after I started teaching in those days, I used to go and say, hey, I started teaching before your parents were born. <laughs> so, so I was hanging out and I decided um, another book was, I had one more book. So I wrote this book, sent it off to my publisher at Yale who published the first book. And it really bombed. It just, it, she sent it out for reviews and the reviews were terrible. They were really terrible. And I think not quite as deservedly as they, they would, but the book was not a good book. And uh, the, the editor said, but you know, kind of as a consolation prize, I'm sending you a bunch of books from the catalog. I know you, John, and you'll like these. Well, one of the books turned out to be a book called The Master and His Emissary by a British psychiatrist, philosopher, you know, uh, polymath named Ian McGilchrist called The World, I said, the, the, the Master and His Emissary. Well, I started reading this book and I, I really was transfixed. McGilchrist 
basically says, we don't know how the brain works. I think I'm gonna present you a new one. But part of the, many of the problems that we have today are, can be traced back to an incorrect model of our cognitive system. We really don't know. We, the way we think we think is wrong. Well, this just, the lights went on. I, 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 I really mean it. The, some light went on and I said, this guy's got the answer to a lot of what I have been puzzled about. And so I began to revise my writing and that's where this new book you showed came. Um, now, let me tell you a little bit about McGilchrist's model, because that's where I believe the system change has to lie. Uh, Eric and I met at a, at a, at a gathering after a, a, an event that a Boston consulting firm had done. I'd written a, a paper uh, for their publication that uh, asked the same question Erica did. Where, 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 where do we have to go? And my, my, uh, my response to that is, look, I think we, trying to change our belief structure is a good step. I think it makes great sense to stop thinking about the world as a machine and to stop thinking about people as machines, think about the world as complex and think about people as caring, but that still doesn't get to the roots. The real question is how did we get to think that way? How, how did we decide that that was the way the world is and that people are? And it's, McGilchrist says, well, that's, I can tell you, I can explain that. It's because the right and the left brain attend to the world differently, present their worlds to us, and we act on them. And the nature of our action depends on which of those hemispheres has dominated, which has the last word. And that modernity is a culture, is, a, is an era, it's a cultural era for four or 500 years has been characterized by increasing dominance of the left hemisphere. And that these kind of ideas are the direct consequence of the way the left hemisphere looks at the world, picks up little pieces of it, and leads us to create our institutions on its basis. Now, a little bit about that. The right Hemisphere, according to McGilchrist, is the one that's connected to the world. It, it's the one the senses are connected to. So when we see things or hear things or taste things, whatever kind of information is being passed goes to the right brain. So it's connected. Its world is alive. Its world is contextual. Its world is contemporary. The left brain, on the other hand, is disconnected. It has no direct connection to our senses. So it's an internal world. And it has been created by what we have thought for a long time is how the brain works, by mirroring the world. That's the Cartesian view of the world and kind of analyzing it with its logical structure. So it is, it is a collection of theories and facts and decontextualized objects, things that it uses to recreate and represent the world to the acting human being. So John, the best, one, one, one comment and then I'll, so the best way to, that I, I have to sort of wrap this up in, in a, in a understandable way is to, and I, uh, 
write the 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 uh, my poems. Uh, there's one starting the book that we are really fraternal twins. That we have two people. We are two actors, two very different actors, and, and it all depends on which side of the brain is the one that's been dominating us. At any one time, it's hard to tell, but over time, an individual's character, kind of the character, are you caring or are you uncaring and instrumental, and depend on which one has been dominant over a long time, as well then as the society will also have the same kind of characteristics. Erica. Well, I was just actually going to echo a question that Sandra had raised. So, so how does that, how do we understand flourishing then along those two dimensions, the right oh. brain, left brain? Well, let, let me, let me, um, let me hold off for a minute. And I would like to uh, just show you one slide. Um, before I go on, that kind of helps me explain the way the brain works. In fact, it, it, it basically, I think, tells much of the story. So I have to get to screen share sharing somehow. So you'll see sh screen shares at the bottom. Oh, it's at the bottom. Oh, yeah. And you should be yeah, able I, I've got it. to share. Um, I have to see where. Oh, my, I don't see it here. Uh, Damn. Oh, there it is. Nope. Oh, oh, there. Oh, I have to open. I have to let Zoom share my screen. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, security and privacy. I didn't do this before because I didn't know I needed to. Uh, let's Zoom. Oh, oh damn. This is going to be. Let's see if I can do it. And this. if it's a problem, there it I can. Comes. I don't, okay. okay. We can also always share in a link in the chat. Yeah, I think it's going to be okay. Uh, share. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, as soon as I find, there it is. One slide. I'm going to just show this slide. Some of you might have seen this before. This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction. And amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal correct as it were, face, and wait again as it comes round, and you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde, both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave as now, and then it will become the normal face again there. And note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear there, your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge, which will actually counter signals bottom up from the senses and force an extraordinary illusion in which the sensory information of the present is cancelled by immense knowledge derived from the past because you've seen so many faces all with their noses sticking out. So it's just impossible to see that as correctly hollow. Okay, got to get back to where we are. Okay, well, this was done a long time before 
McGilchrist wrote his book, but it basically is saying, look what the left brain can do. It, 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 has, it has been extracting a model of what a face is over your lifetime, and it knows that noses stick out. And it's just telling the right brain, bullshit, I know better than you do. And so this is a, a pretty, pretty graphic uh, demonstration that McGill Chris was really on to something. But let's, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking too much, so let, let me try to sort of hasten things up and, and answer your question and, and, and jump forward. Well, anyway, uh, in the, in the following comments, I'll, I will try to say is, why, why is this important and what, what do you do with it? But why flourishing? Well, the way I've defined flourishing is that it's uh, a two-part um, thing. Flourishing shows up in two ways. It shows up as personal wholeness and it shows up as social coherence. Personal wholeness is uh, uh, you know, authentic behavior. You know, yourself, who am I? Acting on your own. You can say it in many ways. And social coherence is, is cohering with the, the institutional rules, is behaving normally. And as social animals, that's what makes us special. Well, it turns out that personal wholeness lines up pretty damn perfectly with the way the right hemisphere works. And social coherence lines up almost perfectly with the way the left hemisphere works. And so if you wanna flourish, you need to balance the left and the right because we need both. And the problems with the world is that we're not using the right, that modernity is an example of a culture in which the left brain has dominated. And its instrumental, unrealistic ways have led to these unintended consequences that are causing us such concern. Now, in a nutshell, jumping over a whole lot, because I want to give you guys a chance. If we're going to do something about this, the way that has to we have to go is to rebalance the brain, to get the right brain back into some balance with the left. Now the brain fortunately is plastic. It has changed. It changes as one grows from over a lifetime and it changes culturally, sort of phylogenically over time for our species. And McGilchrist is, is pretty clear in showing different cultures in historically have, have shifted from right to left brain. And you can see this in just the nature of the culture. So one set of practices to bring to strengthen the right brain is, is, are things we know how to do. Mindfulness exercises literally bring the right brain into action. Designing presence in our artifacts, building speed bumps, wake us up, reconnect the right brain. There are other ways to do this. But the whole idea is that we need to, to, to work at that level. If we're going to change the system, we're, we're going to have to change it so that the right brain of the individual and thence the right brain of our cultures gets to a point at which the system's balanced and permits these emergent properties like flourishing to, to show up. Um, let me stop there. Sort of abrupt, but uh, it doesn't need much more detail. That's really it. It takes a while to, to get to the point of, of the argument where I think for me, it's pretty clear that the right brain left brain model is real and can explain a lot of things. And that offers us a way out. Now, can I guarantee this? Absolutely not. My last sort of comments will be, the left brain deals with possibility. Right brain, we deals with possibility. The left brain deals with probability. 
it's always like it likes certainty. The right brain says, I don't know. Come on, I can't do this. I'm not, I, I can tell you what's going on right now, but I can't predict what the future is. So we have to have some confidence in this model and then stick to it. People always get into this argument, well, John, you're awfully pessimistic. Why an opt I'm not either pessimistic or optimistic. That's, that's, a, that's a left brain notion that says I calculating the probability that this is gonna work or not. I'm hopeful. Hope, hope is about believing that you're doing the right thing, sticking with it and presuming it's gonna turn out right. So John, because I know you have a very hard stop at 1 p.m. Um, and I have a feeling you will address some more of your insights if we turn it now over to Q&A yep. um, with our audience. I think I'd like to do that right now. And I, you know, I, I know this, this chat has been just blowing up. So thank wow. you for, for this engagement. And there's no chance we will get to everyone today at all. Um, but the chat will be available to everyone. And I'm sure John is uh, willing to entertain some communications through email if you're interested. Absolutely. Um, so uh, why don't we why don't we start? I, I again, I've, I saw Ger Gerd, I've seen a few of your comments come up. Um, so I I just like to invite you if you if you would like to unmute and, and ask John some of your questions. I know you're very interested in transform, transforming organizations. So how do we take these insights into our organizations? Are you still here, Gerd? Uh, Gerd Hofillen, I'm not sure if you're here still. Maybe not. Okay, um, so we will we'll move on. Um, I did want to invite Sandra also because I think there are some nice um, synergies with some of the work she's been doing around transformation and changing the narrative. Sandra, would you like to jump on? Thank you. Uh, John, actually John inspired me years ago when he introduced me to this book, The Master and Emissary. Um, and so part of my thinking has, has really followed along the same lines that John's has because um, because I've recognized the importance of the narrative and the story that we're telling ourselves. Um, and so, John, I, you know, you, you answered some of the questions that I had. I, I wanted you to address this right, right and left brain thing. Um, it just seems to me to get to system change, we need more of a, of a wholesale sort of shift of mind back to uh, rebalancing, as you put it so beautifully. It gave me a great insight. Um, because it's the first time I've really understood why individuals need to be rebalanced. Um, so how, but my question is, how do we get from the individual to this wholesale shift that we need? Well, we are designing, the world we live in, we designed. And the world that we have, we designed is a modern world. It's different from the worlds that preceded it. It's different in the structure of the beliefs. It's different in the norms. Uh, if we make this difference, we'll begin to design differently. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. There is, there, there has. I think you have to make make a real distinction between the instantaneous shift of an idea. I can do in a minute. I say, okay the divided brain model is the right one. I'm going to follow it. But once you've done that, the following changes are going to occur very, very slowly and incrementally as you uh, begin to say, oh, well, I want to fix this and which one you now you're going to use the left brain to help prioritize things. But this is a, a generational issue. And uh, you know, you can now get into a different conversation is do we have the time, but that's a different conversation. I am going to stick with my hope and say, let's do it. And, you know, be hopeful about it. Great. Uh, Ravi, I know you had put a few remarks in the chat. Would you like to have, have a question or two with, with John? 
Yeah, th there are three things I'm interested in knowing your views on. Uh, I really like the flourishing concept. Uh, and the three things I want you to touch on are very briefly trade offs. I see the current trend in electrical, electrical vehicles moving away from petrol cars, but that will increase the need for electricity. So this idea of uh, becoming more sustainable uh, energy wise, uh, the trade offs are involved. The second one is, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you talk about uh, root causes. I think one of the main root causes is consumption, increasing consumption. Would you say oh, that again, Robbie? Root causes. You talk yeah. about root causes, and one of yeah. the major root causes is increasing consumption. Oh. So, how do we contain consumption? And third one is, you know, the spirituality group. Uh, the spirituality group in Academy of Management. They talk about contentment, uh, contentment, spirituality, all that is detached, detached, detached from the worldly needs. So, unless you address those things, what okay. do we do? Yeah. Um, well, we should be doing whatever we can to slow things down. So, although I'm critical, and I argue that, that eco-efficiency and technology are not the answer, that they, they do not bring us system change at the level that's absolutely essential, they can, in fact, slow things down, give us more time for that hope to work out. Now, I don't know the answer to whether, you know, the electric car there is, is the right thing or not. Um, but that's a, that's a question that, that, you know, that, that, that probably, you know, I, I obviously, we, it, it um, looks like a very good idea. Now, on the area, let me start with the last one, spirituality. Spirituality is a, a right brain phenomenon. And one of one of McGilchrist's findings and, and what he writes about is that if you, you get out of our 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 Western sort of mindset and begin to look at, at other cultures, starting with indigenous cultures and many of the Eastern cultures, the right brain is much more of uh, a, a player that that uh, transcendence is is a, a right brain phenomenon. It is being connected to the world and just being awed by it. And so, true spirituality is is an important uh, practice to strengthen the right brain. We we benefit greatly by bringing into our practices those that were, were can be taken from these other cultures indigenous and, and, and Eastern cultures. Mindfulness uh, is clearly one of them that has, has been uh, imported uh, and, and uh, works. Now, I, I, that's two of the three, but I, I've already forgotten the middle one, but question. I think there was content, contentment. Oh. Or is that the, is that the second yeah. one? Or yeah, the contentment, one? contentment. Contentment is an assessment one makes by looking at their life. And if you're flourishing, I, I, I would certainly say, if someone asks you, are you content? You're gonna say yes, because you're, you're, you are satisfying the, these potentials. You know, it's, it's a, it, it, the flourishing is important. It's different from most measures of well-being. You ask them, it's very different from the conventional notion of happiness. Happiness is, is largely, are you happy? Happy when? Happy now? Are you happy? Flourishing is an existential quality. You are, it, it, there may be days where you are very unhappy because things aren't working out today, but you're flourishing because things aren't always going to be working out, but over time you're taking care, you're becoming personally whole and you're cohering socially. That's what flourishing is and it will bring contentment. I mean, I think contentment, it, you, you find that, that, I'm not a scholar of, of Eastern uh, cultures, but contentment is, is certainly much more prevalent as a metric for evaluating individual lives in the culture. Um, I think if we become more 
brain will begin to find people will maybe stumble on using contentment here too. So I think we probably only have time for two, maybe three more questions, but I wanted to invite Donna um, Nellam, um, who, who's an, an inst uninstitution co-founder uh, to, to ask her question. Thank you. Uh, delightful to be here and it's uninstitution and want to be clear even in the name of this, um, it's not anti-institutions, it's the full recognition that we need our institutions and society to be healthy and we need to rebalance society. So I very much align with all that you've just been sharing there. And for me, it starts to, it, for us, it starts to bump into this question of collaboration. Um, been doing some research and, and, and observing, um, especially, well, over decades, but over this last year in particular, a real uh, true lack of collaboration in our world, a lot of polarization, even amongst those experts and practitioners that believe that there's a need for change and I believe that there's a need for regenerative um, practice, etc. There's so much debate. And yet what we need is to bring all of us together more, to learn from one another. So the very concepts that you're bringing forward of in McGill, Chris, which speaks to the need to integrate more those parts of the brain. Some of us are better than others. Some cultures are better than others. So we really all truly do need to collaborate to truly co-create words that are become buzzwords. Um, and it's less about ego, we're all important, we want to make a difference, we want to feel that what we're doing matters, but to truly co-create the hive brain, the hive mind thing where we come together, learn from one another, and create and co-create something that no one, one of us would have been, been able to figure out ourselves. So that's the kind of the cutting edge work that we're involved in doing, which is like, it's not about us at all. It's really about how do we bring all this stuff together to start experimenting more, to learn more, because it seems like this is about learning, not just about concepts. Sorry, long-winded, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Donna, because you're right. I mean, you're, what you're talking about is really learning. Uh, what, what, le le learning that is embedded in, in, in the structure of the institution in its brain, in its right brain. Collaboration clearly is a, a, a requires connectedness. If you're not collaborating, you're not connected. And it is essential that we re-energize the right brain. Uh, what goes for collaboration as you I think are implying today is often not collaborating. It's simply acting together under a set of predetermined rules. Collaboration has to be creative. The right brain is the creative side. The left brain can't create anything but other configurations of what it already knows. The left brain is the one that is artistic, music, mu musical, uses metaphor, is the poet works with what we already know, but can apply it to new situations in new and different ways. That, that's the secret. So I think you're, uh, we, we may use a few different kind of words, but we're right, right on the same path. So I also wanted to invite Donald, are you still here? Um, First of all, John, great to see you again. Same. I love what you've been talking about. Um, I have a couple of thoughts in this respect. We work on an individual basis or on a community basis, but looking at the dynamics of climate change, the sudden emergence of a COVID pandemic and the likelihood of others like that again soon, and I'm working with several virologists, we've documented at least 40 cousins of COVID that are ready to jump out of the forest. And I'm not a pessimist. Now, what I want to th say is a couple of things. One, we need to be able to scale up this kind of collaborative change so as to accelerate the transition to the post-fossil carbon society and accelerate toward equity in society and empathy in society, many of what you're implying. So I wanna ask you one question. What about 
experiments like Bhutan's great gross national product, I'm sorry, gross national happiness instead of gross national product. Bigger is better, more is better, richer is better, faster is better, inequity is better, and all of that blah, blah, blah that we have, whether we like it or not. Now, put that in the context of the fact that about 800, I mean, about, yeah, about 800 million net increase in Homo sapiens on the planet per year. Here is the big elephant in the house. Well, I... That is driving all of this stuff. And sure, the super rich are driving it and they want to get more super rich, but how in heaven's name are we going to be able to accelerate the transition that we need to a post-fossil carbon society, to a society that looks at stabilizing the human population at X billion or X point two billion. That isn't in the equation. Anything that comes out of the uh, different groups say nothing about global population control, which is the biggest thing that's driving all of this. The rest of it is peanuts. Thanks, Don. Um, I couldn't uh, agree with you uh, more. Um, but if you ask me, you ask me how 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 can we accelerate this? I mean, it's, I'm not going to answer that question. It's the wrong question to ask because it, it 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 it's important to do that. But that's not the answer. Nor is that the answer. If it, we don't know the answer to these questions, they are imponderables. If we approach it from a left brain point of view. Absolutely imponderables. But yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, very not sure. I'm very confident that if we begin to make these changes and we start start caring instead of using, we will become more knowledgeable. We will begin to understand the system better. And we will come up then maybe with answers to the terribly consequential issues that you raise terribly no 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 arguing with them but if we simply try to think our way through rationally and with some kind of calculus uh i i don't think we're going to make it well but my point is this how are we going to put groups together and experimentally get these things going and multiple loci around the planet to be able to make the necessary changes. Otherwise, climate change will go not only two degrees centigrade beyond centigrade beyond whatever we were, three, four, five, six, seven, and that will take care of the population. I would love to have an answer, but I, I, I do not. And I think that's 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 one hell of a way to end a, a, a meeting like that but the answer's out there the answer's with with with, with all yeah. of us yeah the, the, answer, the answer is just to begin i do not know and okay. I, in I, this I, in this respect i do have to run folks. yeah okay in this respect one new book that i've found useful okay. is regeneration ending the climate crisis in one generation by paul hawkins Thank you. He and his 200 scientists have some good ideas. Thank you so much. Um, because John has to run and we're a minute into his next um, engagement, I do have to close our necessary conversation today. It's, a, as always, a pleasure and an honor to see you all here. John, thank you so very much. Um, You're welcome. And we'll look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone.